Hello and welcome to another TLDR US video. With seemingly the entire world focused on the presidential race between Joe Biden and Donald Trump, it's somewhat understandable that many of the down-ballot races got shoved to the side. But now that some of the chaos has died down, it's worth talking about what happened in those races. Because the simple fact that many have largely missed is that, with the caveat of Donald Trump, the 2020 election was a pretty good one for the Republicans. On the face of it, saying that November was a good one for the GOP sounds somewhat absurd. They're clinging onto the Senate by the narrowest of margins, with the potential for that to shift even further when we get to the Georgia runoffs in January. And they're also still in the minority in the House, and of course, they lost the presidency. But dig a little deeper and you'll find some trends that should give Schumer and Pelosi some pause. If you haven't already, consider subscribing to the channel. Thanks to everyone who has recently and hit the bell icon, but a bunch of you still haven't and your backing would mean a lot. If you wonder why we always waste our time asking you to subscribe, I actually wrote a blog on our website explaining, and that's linked down below. Let's start with the house. Going into November, most pollsters, pundits and politicians were feeling pretty bullish about the Democrats' odds in the house. Whether or not they'd maintain their victory wasn't the question. The question was how much they'd increase it by. In fact, in an interview with David Axelrod in August, Speaker Pelosi said that in the most pessimistic outcome, her party would still make double-digit gains. To be fair, she also included the caveat that that was only the view from the moment and that it could change between August and November. But the thing is, by most measures, not a ton did change. The day before the election, the Cook Political Report came out with a piece basically saying the same thing. But right now, it's looking like the Democrats will be lucky if their losses don't reach the double digits. So, what happened? Well, it's hard to say. We'll probably have to wait a couple months for there to be a full examination of everything that went down on November 3rd, but we've got a few good indicators to work with already. The first was the Democratic Party's failure to bring Hispanics into the fold. This is a story that played out across the country on election day. It's largely why Biden's margins in Texas and Florida were much worse than have been anticipated, and why Democrats, despite seemingly good odds, didn't flip a single seat in Texas, and even lost two somewhat safer seats in the Miami area. This failure will almost certainly be the biggest story in the election for Democratic higher-ups to try and figure out what they need to change. There's also the candidate factor though. The Republican Party, with only a couple of QAnon exceptions, were really good at recruiting good candidates. Specifically, candidates that weren't old white men. The GOP's success was, with a few exceptions, led by women. While this might not be ideal for Democrats, who are hoping that Trump's, well, everything, would send women fleeing from the Republican Party, is a pretty good sign for the general trajectory of gender dynamics in American politics, and shows that 2018, with its record number of women elected, was not just an anomaly. Government positions may still be dominated by men, but it's looking like that domination is in its waning years. And speaking of old white men, let's talk about the Senate. We should start by saying that every single sentence in the next few minutes should have an asterisk next to it. Georgia. As the results currently stand, Democrats have 48 seats and Republicans have 50. The missing two are both in Georgia and are going to runoffs that will be held on January 5th. If Democrats win both, they will, with Vice President Kamala Harris as the tiebreaker, have effective control of the Senate. If they lose both, they're screwed. Okay, perhaps that's a tad too dramatic, but it'll be a very painful two to four years for President Biden if he has to drag two Republicans into supporting every major piece of legislation he wants to be passed. Anyway, Georgia aside, let's talk about what went down in that weird upper chamber on election night, starting off with the flips. Three seats have changed party, one in Colorado, one in Arizona, and one in Alabama. The first two swung to the Democrats, with John Hickenlooper, 10 out of 10 name by the way, and Mark Kelly becoming the newest senators from Colorado and Arizona respectively, defeating incumbents Cory Gardner and Martha McSally. Alabama's Doug Jones, a Democrat meanwhile, fell to his Republican challenger Tommy Tuberville. 
Together, this creates a net gain of a whole one seat for the Democrats. Which, to be fair, in a body as finicky as the Senate, can be really important, but it's a far cry from where the Democrats wanted this to end up. In the months before the election, most were predicting that Democrats had the chance of winning control of the Senate. The races in Maine, Montana, Iowa, North Carolina, South Carolina, and maybe even Texas and Kansas if they were lucky, were supposed to be competitive for the Democrats. Most had even expected Maine and North Carolina to vote out their Republican incumbents. They weren't expected to win all of these states, but there were high hopes that they could pick up a fair few of them. But they didn't. Not a single one of those states swung to the Democrats. In some of them, it wasn't even close. In Maine, which again was largely expected to swing blue, Republican incumbent Susan Collins won by 8 points, with over 50% of the vote. The reason for the Democratic failures in the Senate are less concrete and straightforward than in the House. Part of it is likely incumbency advantage. Nearly every race that was theoretically a toss-up had a Republican incumbent, but a larger part of it was likely just down to the candidates. North Carolina Democrat Cal Cunningham, for example, certainly didn't do himself any favours by entangling himself in an extramarital affair during the campaign. Sarah Gideon of Maine, meanwhile, was fairly unproblematic, but faced the equally difficult issue that her opponent, longtime Senator Susan Collins, had tied herself so thoroughly to the culture of Maine that throwing her out just went against the basic instincts of so many Mainers. But whatever the reason, the result is the same. Democrats fell far short of where they wanted to be in the Senate. Will Georgia shake things up? Well, possibly, and we'll talk about that more in another video. But as things stand now, Senate Democratic leader Chuck Schumer is in a bit of an unpleasant situation. Of course, a Republican Senate doesn't necessarily mean that things won't get done. It's abundantly possible that Biden might be able to work with Republican moderates like Susan Collins, Lisa Murkowski, and maybe even Mitt Romney, but it's going to be a constant uphill climb. The final down-ballot situation we should take a look at is state legislatures. These races may seem minor and irrelevant, but the implications of them are massive. Not just because state governments hold a lot more power than they're often portrayed as having, but also because, once again, it's redistricting time. Basically, every 10 years, states have to adjust the number of congressional districts and district lines in accordance with the decade's population shifts. This process, you may recall, is where we get gerrymandering. Because, while in a few states the redistricting is done by an independent commission, in most, control is in the hands of the state legislature. So the party who controls that gets to decide what the map looks like for the next decade. In potential swing states like Texas and North Carolina, this could have massive effects on governance for the next decade to come. Needless to say, Democrats did not want Republicans to have control of this process. They poured massive amounts of money into states across the board, but the biggest prize was always Texas. With redistricting power in the second largest state in the Union, Democrats could have had the chance to make inroads, both locally and in Washington. But alas, their efforts fell short. Democrats didn't flip the legislature in Texas. They didn't flip North Carolina's. They didn't flip Florida's. The party's failure to capture seats in state capitals occurred pretty much everywhere. So basically, the next decade is going to see a lot of uphill battles for the Democrats. Now, it is true that capturing the presidency mattered a lot. Though the White House is not nearly as powerful as some might like to think, Few in possession of their marbles would say that switching the executive from Donald Trump to Joe Biden won't change anything, and Democrats should celebrate that. But Republicans also have reasons for celebration too. The power they've held in the House, the Senate, and state legislatures will be incredibly influential in the coming years. It also signals that the party is not nearly as doomed as some might have predicted. The GOP is not going to collapse just because they've lost the White House. Their success in so many of these down-ballot races proves that the party still holds wide appeal beyond Trump. It also indicates that life will not be easy for National Democrats in the coming years. Not just because Biden and Pelosi will have to struggle to get anything passed in the Senate, 
but also simply because this is not the trend you want to see when your party takes the presidency. Most new presidents have, at least in their first two years, control of Congress. This allows them to pass at least a couple of major pieces of legislation before their numbers inevitably decrease in the midterms, which are notoriously bad for the incumbent party. But with Biden's presidency already starting off on shaky footing, it's going to be a long four years for Democrats. But who knows? Maybe those 40 odd years in the Senate that people so often attacked will help Biden work with a growing GOP. What do you think though? Let us know your thoughts in the comments below. Be sure to subscribe to the channel and hit the bell icon to be notified when we release further videos in the future. Special thanks to our Patreon backers who make videos like this one possible. And if you want to see your name at the end of videos, then you too can back us on Patreon. The link to that's in the description.